chapter 4, verses 8 through 17 is where we're going to be this morning. If you find that in your Bibles, go ahead and stand with me for the reading of God's Word. 2 Kings, in the Old Testament, chapter 4, verses 8 through 17. 2 Kings, chapter 4, verses 8 through 17. This is what it says. It says, And it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where was a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as oft as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. And she said unto her husband, Behold now, I perceive that this is an holy man of God, which passes by us continually. Let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall, and let us set for him there a bed and a table and a stool and a candlestick, and it shall be when he cometh to us that he shall turn in thither. And it fell on a day that he came thither, and he turned into the chamber and lay there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, Call this Shunammite, Shunammite woman, or Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him. And he said unto her, Say now unto her, Behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. What is to be done for thee? Wouldest thou be spoken for to the king, or to the captain of the host? And she answered, I dwell among mine own people. And he said, What then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, Verily she hath no child, and her husband is old. And he said, Call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the door. And he said, About this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And she said, Nay, my lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaid. And a woman conceived to bear a son at that season that Elisha had said unto her, According to the time of life. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful, and again, we're thankful for our moms and uh, those that have come this morning that we can pay homage to them uh, for motherhood. And uh, we're thankful, and it sounds silly, but where would we be without mothers? I mean, uh, where would we be without mothers bearing children? And uh, of course, we couldn't be here. Uh, but Lord, we're thankful for them because there's much more to motherhood than just being bearers of children. And so, Lord, we're thankful for them. And uh, Lord, we pray that you bless us this morning in this time that we can be in your word and help us to pay proper homage to our moms who are represented here this morning with us. And so just bless us now and give us a good time in your word. And Lord, this is uh, a word that's meant to encourage. And uh, so, Lord, again, just bless us now together and uh, help us to uh, rightfully pay homage to our moms. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, this is a unique account in our Bible. Of course, it's been uh, specifically chosen because of the tribute that we want to pay to our moms this morning. And so my title this morning is a tribute to great women of God. And I believe here in our scripture um, that it, this is a unique count, account in that the woman mentioned here is... It, it, it's mentioned only one time this way in all of Scripture. That this woman here, and uh, I believe all women are held in a specific light. And uh, when we look at those first few words of uh, verse 8, it says, And it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where it was a great woman. And so there's uh, what God says about this woman, that she was a great woman. Now what is it uh, about you? Here this morning, as I look about uh, all our moms here, what is it about you that makes God refer to you as great women? Because I believe we can take this from our text and say that, you know what, there's, there's many characteristics that are mentioned about this woman that every woman that I'm looking at this morning um, exudes these same, uh, same qualities. And so we're going to look at this morning and, and just kind of study this a little bit and just pay homage to our moms this morning, our mothers. And so look at verse 8 again. It says, And it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where was a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as oft as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. And so what was it that God said? What was it about this woman? 
woman that God sent this woman was great. Well, as we look a little deeper into that verse 8, we see there in, in the second part of that verse, it says, and she constrained him to eat bread. And constrained means that what this woman did is she urged uh, this man of God, uh, she urged him to uh, stop and, and, and allow her to prepare him something to eat. Now, the conversation, when you think about that word uh, constrained, the conversation would be something like this. Uh, she would say, uh, as he's passing by, I insist that you stop and, and allow me to, to uh, uh, perform this duty for you. And he said, he would have responded with, but, but I couldn't. And she would have said, and I got to capitalize in my notes, but I insist. So she was constraining him. And so there was something about her that was more than just skin deep. What do you mean by that? Well, this wasn't an invitation of convenience. As you look there in, in, in the rest of that part, uh, uh, verse 8, uh, the latter part of that, it says, And as so it was, that as oft as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. And so it wasn't just a matter of convenience that this woman saw this man of God and said, You know, allow me. But she said, every time you come by, allow me, you see. And so he did. Uh, basically, she was, uh, it was said there that in, uh, in verse, that latter part of verse 8, it said, as oft as. Now, you know what that means, as oft as. Um, when you look in, in, in uh, Scripture, as oft as, that exact term is used one other time. And it's used in, in 1 Corinthians 11. And it's talking about taking the Lord's Supper. Uh, verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 25 says, After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. And so when you think about the Lord's Supper, the Lord is saying, You're doing this in remembrance of me. Do it as often as you need it, is what he's saying. So as oft as is... That woman was telling that man as oft as you need. It's not what she was saying is it's not about my convenience. It's about your convenience. You come as oft as you need to come. And so when you see that, you're looking at how God says this was a great woman. And you might say, well, what, what, what kind of point is he trying to make? What was he trying to show us about our, our great women? Well, great women are compassionate for fellow men. And, and many times, and I know every one of you here, many times you have been put out and never thought about yourself at all. You've allowed yourself to be put out for fellow uh, man. Now, when I'm talking about fellow man, I'm not talking about just uh, men, but I'm talking about even women. There's times you women do things for each other uh, that you'll, you know, you'll give the shirt off your back to others, you see, and you'll do. And, and God said that's the characteristic of a great woman. That when she's not just thinking about herself, she's thinking about others, you see. And it's not just a matter of convenience. It's not just when I feel like it. it, it you know, it, it, what he's talking about is a great woman does it at the whim of others. And, and she bases it on their deeds, not her need, and not her convenience. And so, so you see what he's saying. And, and in other words, it's about what the recipient needs, not at the whim of the administrator. See, the woman in this, this passage of Scripture, she was the administrator. She's the one that's telling him, you come whenever you need, and, and I will provide for you, you see. And God's saying, There's, that's a great woman, you know. And, and like I said, I'm not trying to shame you in any end. I can look out here and I can say, I can see this and every woman that we, we've ever had come through our doors. They have that kind of, uh, kind of characteristic to them. And, and what makes a great woman willing to be to willing to to come to that level? Well, that's what leads us to our next point. Look at verse nine and ten. Verse nine and ten says, and she said unto her husband, Behold, now I perceive that this is an holy man of God, which passes by continually. Let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the, on the wall, and let us uh, set for him there a bed and a table and a stool and a, a candlestick. And it shall be when he cometh to us that he shall turn in thither. And so not only was she a great woman because she had compassion for fellow men, but what I learned from these, uh, that verse 9 and 10 
is that she was a great woman because she was constrained by a compassionate God. Hey, God. What you'll find out is that's really what makes you, is the God that you allow in your life. Hey, Amen. Mm -hmm. And that's why you're here this morning, really. I mean, you're not here, you know, basically, you're not here to see me. I mean, we're, none of us are here uh, for that specific purpose. We're here to meet with God, mm -hmm. is what it is. And so what I'm saying is what makes a great woman compassionate to fellow man is she was constrained by a compassionate God. Constrained means, it means that basically she's at God's will. She wants to please God. And, and, and so she, you know, God, whatever you want from me, I will do. You know, that's what God's saying about this great woman. And recognize also this, that she wasn't compelled by the benefit of pleasing God's man. What do you mean by that? Well, we'll get this. Some may be motivated. If you was to read this passage through a couple different times, and you was to ask yourself, why would she do this? Why would she, why would she go out of her way to provide for this uh, holy man of God? You know, what was the purpose? And you can read through this, and you might get, a, uh, get the wrong sense of what's going on here. Because you can read this, and you can look at the end, and you can go, aha. She had a need. She was barren. And, and possibly, was she doing just so that she could get her need met? But I can dispel that. I can say, you know what? That's not it at all. Because, because what you'll see is, what I'm saying is, some may, be, some may think she's motivated by the idea that, oh, this is God's man, so I'm going to do this just to please God. And I, I better do for God's man. If I expect God to do anything for me, I better do for God's man. What you'll find out is she wasn't thinking that at all. How do you know that? Look at verse 9. Verse 9, it says, And she said unto her husband, Behold now, I perceive that this is an holy man of God. What I'm saying is, I don't know how many times she had hosted this man in her house that she didn't even know it was a holy man. She was just doing it because she had compassion for fellow man. But then, eventually, in verse 9, she goes to her husband and says, I perceive that this is a holy man of God. So in other words, it's not a lie like Elijah came there and, and told her, hey, you do for me and I'll do for you. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. I don't believe that was in it at all. I don't even believe she knew for sure that Elijah even was anything special. You see. But, and so what I'm saying is that, that, I believe, undoes that premise that we think that possibly she's doing this just so she can get something from God. I don't believe that at all. So again, can I say this? That, that again, a great woman isn't compelled in her actions so that, it, so that she can try to obtain favor from God. Now, and like I said, if you don't read this account carefully... Uh, you might think she's trying to, or if you have read it, uh, the whole thing it, it, quickly through, you might think that she's trying to gain favor for her barrenness. And, and of course, can I go a little bit farther? We know what bar being barren is, right? In other words, uh, when she was barren, that means that she couldn't have a child. Her husband was getting up in later years, and it sounds like she hadn't had a child. Matter of fact, it says right there in verse 14, because uh, Elijah, come, Elijah comes to Gehazi, which is his, his helper, and he says, what is it we can do for this lady? She's refusing to allow us to do anything for her. She says, I don't need anything. I'm just a man of my, or, or a person of my own people. Uh, I don't live any spectacular life. I don't need you to do anything for me. So Elijah comes to Gehazi and says, what is it we can do for her? And Gehazi says, well, I noticed this. In other words, you know, and, and, and I can only suspect, I don't know how, how he knew that she was barren. You know, whether she, uh, Gehazi had passed by her bedroom window at night and she was uh, at her bed praying, you know, for God to give her a child. I have no idea. But somehow Gehazi knew. Because verse 14, it says, What then is it to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, Verily she has no child when her husband is old. Now, I say all that to say that, that we know what barrenness is, but I don't know that we know the impact that barrenness had. You know, today, I got a sister who's never had children, and I don't know if it was in their ability to have children or not. Um, she was one, she's one of my oldest sisters, and they just, they, she got married right out of high school, and her and 
Joe have been married for since 1972. They've been married. And they've never had children. And, you know, and I don't know if it's because they couldn't or because they opted not to. And so today what we would say is, you know, it's, I mean, if, if a couple doesn't have children, you don't look down on them. You just think, well, it's a choice they made. Or if they couldn't, if it was, you know, maybe something happened and they couldn't have children. But, I mean, nobody looks down on them like that. But back in the Bible days, I'm not saying that people look down on them, but for some reason women in that day seemed to, you know, it seemed to be uh, one of the greatest tragedies for a woman in that day. Not to be able to have children. And, and so as I, what I'm saying here, what we're getting at here, is God says that this is a great woman. And, and what we see about this great woman is she wasn't, do, she wasn't doing these things for the man of God so that she could get favor from God. You see. There's only one thing uh, that I see that made this, you know, that would have really has the answer to it. Well, then what is it? Only one thing I can see reveals why she was doing what she was doing. Look at verse 8. Back to verse 8. It says, And it fell on that day that Elisha passed to Shunem where was a great woman. And she's constrained to eat bread. And so it was that as often as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. So the only one thing that I can attribute to the characteristic of this woman was that she was a great woman because she was serving a great God. She was living a great living faith in a great God. Now you, may, you might ask yourself, what is a living faith? Well, a living faith would be a faith that is recognized by all, uh, all who are around you. And they look at you and they say, now, now there's something different. I've said this many times that, you know, what our desire would be, uh, you know, if I, if someone was to ask me, uh, uh, Pastor, I just got to say recently, and, and uh, what, you know, what, what is my duty as a Christian? And I'd say, here's your one and great duty, of course, is number one, to serve God. And number two, to, to be a testimony of the God you serve. And, and if they was to say to me, well, how do I know if I'm doing that? Well, what you'll find out is eventually somebody will say, they'll come to you and say, there's something different about you. Can't put my finger on it, but there's something different. And what you'll find out is that's, that's somebody that's living as a testimony to God. And, and it can be a myriad of things that they recognize. How you live, how you dress, how you act, your response to people, you know, uh, your... Uh, your ability to make someone comfortable. There's tons of things that, that, someone, that someone could look at you and say, there's something different about you. And when they say that, that's the great opportunity for you to give glory to God. And say, well, well number one, sir, man, the number one thing in my life that's made a difference in my life is I serve a living God. Mm -hmm. And I have a living faith. And so, so when we talk about this lady, the Shunammite lady, we'd have to say, you know what? She wasn't doing this to gain favor from God. But what she was doing is she was living out her faith as one who trusted in a living God. That's what it's all about. You see. Now, now I, I, as I look out here, you know, can I say there's something different about you? Everyone that I look at, I will hear. One, one of the main things that's different about you is you actually, you know, you actually take the time, even on a Sunday morning. Do you realize what kind of testimony that is? That, that I've talked about this before. you got neighbors all around who, when they peer out, they, they look and they see you getting up and, and going somewhere on Sunday morning. You know, I've heard so many times that people will say, well, Sunday's my time. I just talked to a guy yesterday where uh, Christy and I went out knocking doors and uh, went up the driveway of this guy and was talking to him for some time and uh, was, you know, asking him if he went to church. He told me where he worked and what he did and, you know, how he's two weeks out and two weeks back uh, where he works. Kind of a good setup. And so what he basically told me is, you know, I really don't have time for church. He said, by the time I go work my two weeks and then I get my two weeks,
weeks off. He works a really good job. Um, it's on the oil rigs. And he said, by the time I go do my two weeks and then, and then come home, he said, the, the nice thing about my job is I get two weeks on, two weeks off. He said, so I'll have two weeks off in a row all summer long. You know, two, I'll work two weeks and I'll have two weeks off. So he said, you can't beat the schedule. And so as we're talking and just sharing things and different things and uh, talking about some of the common things that we know, I just said, well, well, what about church? And he said, well, you know, as you know, talking to you about my schedule, he said, you know, I only have two weeks off at a time. And so basically what he's saying is, I don't have time for God. But what I'm saying is when I look at you out here today, and I see you here on Sunday morning, I mean, right there in, in and of itself is a testimony of the God you serve. Amen. Ken, Ken, shh. And so, so as, we, as we talk, and as we see what I uh, talk about this lady, we see that this woman... Um, she's a woman of living faith. That's what's made the difference in her life. That's why God is saying that this is a, a great woman. And, and can I say to you, as you sit here today, you're a woman of a converted soul. And what that does is that does something for you. If you sit here this morning and you know that you've lived on Jesus Christ and you've trusted in Him, the Bible says you can't be the same as you was before you got saved. Bible says you're a new creature. And so you can't be the same. Now some might sit here and go, but, 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 but what do I do? You just keep staying with God and he'll show you what you need to do. Just like this woman here. You know, I mean, this is what God does in the life of someone that trusts in him. That all of a sudden you become a living faith for him. You become a converted soul, you see. And that does something for you. First of all, uh, converted souls have to come to humbleness to receive salvation. So when you trusted in God, the first very first thing that you did when you realized that you needed God is that you humbled yourself. And you can't say that you're not different now because it took humbleness just to realize uh, that you needed salvation. And that forever will change you, you see. And so, so a converted soul... The, that humbleness that you uh, accepted in your life, that converted soul then becomes a contrite spirit. You know, what, you know what contriteness is? I looked it up in the dictionary. It says to realize how insignificant you are and how significant God is. That's a contrite spirit. Now, I'm not just saying this for our moms. I'm saying that this is for everybody. This is what we all do. This is what happens to us all. When we get saved, we realize that we can't save ourselves. We have to humble ourselves to realize that, you know what? It's God and God alone that can save me. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. And so with that converted soul, you become a contrite spirit. And with that, a great, uh, a great woman like it's talking about here also becomes a consecrated woman. Not only do you have a uh, contrite spirit, but you have a, con a consecrated Spirit, that means that I'm his for his use. That's what it all boils down to. And that brings us to our last point. Look at, uh, look at verse 11. Verse 11. And our, our last point is this. A great reward for a great woman. Because we already figured out that this woman wasn't great because she was looking for something. Because she was hoping that if she would take care of God's man, that she could, she could motivate God to take care of her. It's not what it was about at all. Matter of fact, as we, we've already kind of uh, explored this a little bit, but look at verse 11. It says, And it fell on the day that he came thither, and he turned into the chamber and lay there. And he said to Gehazi, a servant, Call this you, my woman. And, and it says, And when he had called her, she stood before him. And he said unto him, Say now unto her, Behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. What is to be done for thee? What is thou be spoken for to the king or to the captain of the host? And she answered, I dwell among mine own people. I got a feeling even that Elisha possibly, he was using Gehazi to interpret. If you notice, he kept talking to Gehazi and telling him. She, she stood right before Elisha. Now, why wasn't Elisha talking directly to her? I'm not even sure that, that Elisha could speak in this Shunammite language. 
And what he's doing is he's going through Gehazi, which possibly what maybe happened is Gehazi, uh, Gehazi maybe was an interpreter for Elijah. I'm just looking at that, at that as I'm reading it right now. And possibly what, what was going on is, is he's using Gehazi to be the interpreter. And he says to Gehazi, as she's standing right there before them, ask her what, she, what I can do for her. And then the response is amazing. The response says, is, uh, again, he said to God, he say now unto her, Behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. What is to be done for thee? Wouldst thou be spoken for the king or to the captain of the host? And she answered, I dwell among my own people. And you might say, well, what did she mean by that? Well, I can tell by the response what she meant. Because God, he basically turned to, to uh, uh, Elisha and said, she says she doesn't need anything. She says, I'm fine. I dwell among my own people. You don't need to do anything for me. And so what happened after that? Then Elisha says to her, or him in verse 14, what then is to be done for her? In other words, if she won't tell us what she needs, Gehazi, have you noticed anything that we can do? And this is where Gehazi says, well... I have noticed that, and maybe it was the talk of the town, that she's without child and she's been plagued with barrenness all her life. And now her husband's getting older and there's no hope of her having a child now. And Elisha says, that's what we'll do for her. And so what ended up happening, look at uh, uh, verse 15, it says, and he called, he said, call her, and when he called, had called her, she stood in the door. And he said, about this season, according to the time of life, uh, thou shalt embrace the son. And she said, nay, nay, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaid. And the woman conceived and bare a son at that season that Elijah had said unto her, according to the time of life. And so, so in closing, um, this is what this is what it boils down to. This brings us to the last point. Um, when, when, when we look at the, this great woman, and we notice that this great woman had a compassion, uh, uh, was compassionate for a fellow man, and it was an unmotivated compassion. She wasn't doing it to try to get God's favor. She was doing it because of what God had already done for her is what it seems like. And she was, and she was, so in other words, she was, like our second point says, she was constrained by a compassionate God. And what's, what's great about this whole thing is even though she wasn't doing it for a reward, what it boils down to is she was rewarded in the end. At the end of the account, we see the prophet did for her. Amen. Beyond what she could have ever imagined. And, and, and when I say to you ladies, you great women, is this very same thing. And I, I don't think I have to say this. None of you are working for a reward. Amen. It just comes natural for many of you. Especially, especially uh, trusting in the Lord. Just like I said, you cannot not be changed when you place your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're a new creature. And, and so as I said, and I don't think I need to, to, to encourage you with this, but what I say is, boy, what great rewards lay in store for you. You might say, well, what, you know, what, I don't know. And, and like I said, great women don't have to know. Amen. And so what a blessing. And so what I'd say to our moms today is great rewards are in store. Amen. What a blessing. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful, Lord. I pray that you continue to bless us and grow us closer to you. We sure are thankful, Lord, for our moms and for all those represented here this morning. And Lord, just as I say,